In a rapidly transforming world, societies and cultures shift in needs, challenges and opportunities, affecting every citizen's capacity to be actively engaged in the civic domain. Education comes forward once again as the primary medium to facilitate access, participation and inclusion for all in public goods, services, decision-making and employment. The Centre for Social Innovation, CSI, is bringing together diverse global experts and practitioners in education and civic engagement to discuss and propose tangible paths to revolutionise the learning process so that learners can be the decision makers of their future. This discussion is co-organised with the Centre for Social Innovation. Give a warm round of applause to, for Dr. Michal Mlinar, Ambassador Permanent Representative of the Slovak Republic to the United Nations, Professor Dr. Niazi Gizilgurek, Member of the European Parliament, Dr. Lucia Vramidu, Director of the Institute for Science Education and Communication at the University of Groningen, Dr. Katerina Theodoridou, Director, R&D and Project Management Center for Social Innovation. The discussion will be moderated by Dr. Sotiris Temisogleus, Director of Strategic Development Center for Social Innovation. Welcome. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming here today to listen to this very interesting panel discussion. Thank you, Cyprus Forum, for organizing this event. And of course, thank you, Cyprus Forum, for having these comfortable sofas this year, <laughs> in contrary to last year's chairs. So uh, yesterday, we heard the, uh, three of the candidates for the presidency focusing a lot of their uh, discussion and talk on education. And I guess it's a, a cliche by now that every time there are challenges in the society, we go back to education and pedagogies. We know and we realize that uh, citizens interact with the society uh, the interaction of the citizens with society, society has changed. The labor market and the ed education have dramatically transformed. And in a post-COVID uh, era, a lot of people seek for more flexibility in space and time. The way they work is transformed. The way they interact with other humans is uh, changed with the environment, but also with uh, education and everything are taking place in different ecosystems, maybe in real life, in virtual life, in cyberspace, everywhere. So we live in a world that is nothing static. We are here to discuss uh, how education can move forward and provide a, a step for the participation of citizens in the making of this, uh, of this service, of this gift. Citizens rightfully demand to have an active role in decision making and through uh, other forms of participation, like uh, social movements, social media, community work, community politics, we see them to move away from mainstream politics and mainstream uh, decision-making centers. So we need to find a, a new way of co-creation of education policies and education initiatives, which are considered to be a medium of mo more informed decision-making, more adaptive to, to change, rapid change, and of course, <coughs> aligned to inclusivity, participation, and democracy. We are here today to discuss maybe what we could say a new social contract on education, to take education uh, in a new uh, level, in a level that will be aligned with the fast ch changes that are happening around us. The education that needs to be based on participation, in crowdsourcing, to take in consideration the needs and the expectations of the citizens, to take in consideration the importance of democracy and inclusivity. And I think today we have the right panel and the right uh, representatives from decision-making bodies, uh, academics, practitioners, experts, uh, politicians, politicians, if I may say, to discuss this. People that work from the community level to the regional and global institutions. And talking about uh, global institutions, I would like to start our discussion with Dr. Uh, Mlinar, the um, uh, Vice President of UNICEF Executive Board and also the Ambassador of the Slo Slovak Republic in, in Cyprus. Doctor, we understand as we describe and we study the past days that uh, participatory education is implemented through inclusive education, the inclusive decision making with the participation of schools, communities, decision makers, academics, uh, uh, a wide spectrum of stakeholders. 
in supranational bodies like UNICEF that many times we hear that they are inclusive, they go to the community, they take their decisions, take into consideration the voices of the people. How, how is this achieved? I mean, it was also a personal uh, puzzle. How, how do you manage a global organization like this to take in consideration the voice of every citizen? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, all the way from New York. Uh, I would start by saying that uh, we have to go to the basics. Uh, uh, we have to uh, see education as a fundamental right. Too often uh, we have seen education as potentially something supplementary which can be delayed or postponed because uh, of uh, maybe uh, economic reforms or other uh, social issues. Uh, and we are often forgetting that uh, by delaying uh, our action, our investment uh, into education, we are risking the future. Uh, and uh, the pandemic has uh, taught us some lessons and we need to make sure that uh, uh, that we have really learned those lessons well. Uh, we are not necessarily uh, too good in, in learning the lessons uh, unless uh, we are really uh, reminded uh, that uh, it is absolutely necessary. Uh, so uh, uh, we really need to make sure that, uh, that no uh, child is deprived uh, of, the, of the fundamental right. Uh, and with the challenges that we have on, on our plates, uh, whether it is uh, conflicts, uh, climate crisis, uh, rapid uh, technological transformation, uh, uh, of course, uh, migration, uh, uh, even uh, infodemia and uh, spread of uh, fake news, uh, and so many other issues, uh, it is an absolute uh, uh, must, uh, uh, it is an imperative uh, uh, that we transform our education systems. Uh, I wanted to also say that uh, actually just last week um, uh, we held in New York uh, the uh, Global uh, Transformation Education Summit uh, over a span of uh, uh, about four days. Uh, it started with, um, uh, with uh, the mobilization day, which was uh, youth-led, continued with uh, civil society-led uh, solutions day, and uh, uh, then uh, it uh, culminated with uh, uh, high-level uh, leaders uh, uh, forum, which uh, really focused a lot uh, on uh, the necessary transformations uh, in education. I am not uh, a statistician and I, I never like statistics too much. Uh, uh, I uh, used to be a high school teacher and I was teaching uh, foreign languages, uh, but uh, uh, we often uh, uh, can, uh, uh, can look at the statistics and there is one particular element which, uh, which shocked me uh, recently. Uh, there is a recent study of the World Bank uh, which uh, actually says that uh, as many as 70% as of 10-year-olds uh, today are unable to understand a simple, uh, simple written text, uh, which is uh, truly shocking. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, there is more. Uh, it actually uh, uh, estimates that uh, we risk losing as much as $21 trillion uh, in potential lifetime uh, earnings in present value, or the equivalent of 17% of uh, today's global GDP, if we uh, don't uh, uh, focus uh, enough of educa on, uh, on education, and if we don't ensure that not only uh, children and young people uh, have uh, uh, universal and equal access to good quality education, but uh, uh, that we adapt the education systems uh, to, the, uh, to the current needs. Uh, because, uh, and that's the last piece of statistics that, uh, that I will mention, uh, today the youth population between the ages of 10 and 24 uh, is 1.8 billion. Uh, which is actually uh, 100 years ago, this was the entire global population. And uh, now we are facing uh, a situation where we need to cater for, for this uh, number of, of young people. And we have a huge responsibility uh, in, in that context, because if we don't ensure that they have uh, 
today they have the education opportunities, tomorrow they have the job opportunities, uh, and uh, other opportunities stemming from then, uh, then of course uh, we, will be, we will be in trouble. We have a blueprint for that, and that is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, SDG 4, which of course uh, 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 is built on leaving no one behind, and that's exactly what needs to, what needs to happen. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Which, uh, and having in mind the previous agenda of the United Nations, the Millennium Development Goals, we saw some slight improvements. So I hope uh, the, the countries that uh, participate in this uh, process to adopt the agenda of 2030. Just to ma ma mention that uh, we have a slide, though. If you put the hashtag, hashtag Cyprus Forum 2022, you can post some questions. And if we have time at the end, we'll ask our uh, panelists. Uh, now, Dr. Gizil Jurek, I guess it was unavoidable to make to you this question. Uh, in many countries around the world, participatory education has been used as a tool to promote peace and coexistence through collective development of education <coughs> narratives. Is this a model to be promoted and developed in Cyprus? I know there were a lot of efforts in many levels. Do you see a way, a tangible way, a path uh, that the Cypriots could be able to follow and implement participatory education methods around the island. Oh, thank you very much, and thank you for the kind invitation to be here. Uh, before I go to your question, Derek, let me say a few words. Because we are invited to discuss an education in an evolving world, but I would say actually in a dissolving world. And of course, uh, uh, I mean, war, crisis of ecology, of economic crisis, immigration, wars, nationalism, etc. You can say what all has to do with education. I think a lot. And the question is, what kind of loyalty do we accept to have from our students, from our kids? Tribal loyalties, ethnocentric loyalties or a sense of empathy, sense of belonging to the community of mankind and not to one nation. And that's the crucial matter to my mind. It's at that level that we have to rethink. And by saying this, of course, I'm coming to the subject of nation states and their role in education. And of course, nation states, we are ethnocentric and we organize an ethnocentric education they don't left any room for the societies because they want to dictate to the societies a sense of identity, a fetish of the identity. So, and of course, now to come to Cyprus, we are a paradise of nationalist obsessions when it comes to idea of identity and exchange, lack of empathy, etc. We don't relate to each other. We don't learn enough about each other, but we talk a lot about each other without knowing nothing. So we judge actually each time. And our, our, our education systems in both communities are unfortunately far away from any sense of uh, empathy, understanding of the other. Beyond this, of course, uh, it's a very uh, nationalistic, ethnocentric education, which doesn't leave any space for civil society environment. I very much appreciate the concept of partitionary uh, education. I was partly implementing this when I was at the University of Cyprus myself. I was working with my students together. I was there naming this learning together. Uh, for example, I mean, each group of students should have write an essay, present it, and discuss it with me. And I was learning from my students, whereby we were all learning together. That's uh, something very good. But imagine in Cyprus, there are two communities members. They, can, they, they cannot see each other. We can't visit each other. We can't go to another school to see what's going on there. And you have, of course, all this uh, uh, history teaching, which is uh, one-sided. It's always, um, you know, based on a kind of self-righteous uh, understanding of events. So we have a serious problem, and I think that's part of the Cyprus conflict. Education in Cyprus became part of the Cyprus conflict, and we have to undermine this. We have to understand this because it is unacceptable to have Greek and Turkish Cypriot students, pupils, which we don't meet, each other, we don't meet, we don't see each other. How can you expect them to develop a collective uh, activity of learning, participatory learning, or collective learning, 
even if they don't have a chance to talk to each other, to get to know each other. So we have a serious problem. Participatory education overall is actually something which minimizes the role of all of nation states and get the societies involved in this. Of course, and this is very important because many countries manage so because they, they are not anymore in 19th century and they don't anymore consider education as forming national consciousness, but they see it as a developing a new society of critical thinking uh, beyond anything else and of empathy. Unfortunately, uh, to our country, that thing is something, it seems something very far away from uh, to realize. But of course, I call here about all politicians and elites who are responsible for this. It's about time to reform education in Cyprus, to go into a peace and reconciliation concept of education. But we don't need this only for approaching wider community. To know the other, help you to know yourself. You need this for a healthy self-awareness also to be, to relate to the rest of the world. So we are. We are. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, I know you are a, a positive uh, person working with students also in the European Parliament. Uh, you are efforts to bring the, all the communities of the island together. And we can discuss about this later, that uh, also from your work and our work, we realize that a lot of things are happening outside the educational system. And our, our youth, not all of them, but a lot of them are interacting to, to create new educational narratives through technology, through social media. And this is a hope. Yeah. And this is where I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Abramidou, working in an academic institution and interacting with uh, students and youth and with the vision to have an open access to sciences about education um, overall. Do you see at that level uh, the creation and the formation of initiatives of participatory uh, education? Would you consider this type of learning where students and especially those coming from marginalized groups will be empowered to participate in this process? I mean, do you have any ex examples from, from your work? Yeah, uh, how many days do we have? I think, uh, yeah, these questions are loaded, but uh, also very important. So thank you for, for raising them. Maybe I will start the other way around. I will start by sharing an example just to give uh, the audience something concrete um, to engage with. And then I will share some of my reflections around this. So um, I've been living in the Netherlands for the past six years, a country with a colonial past. And I've been working with underserved uh, communities, mostly. Um, so what we did with my research team was to curate um, an after-school STEAM program, um, which includes um, interactions between science and arts and technology as well. And what we aim to do um, with this project is basically engage these communities in kind of um, raising the questions that they want to raise about their local communities. For example, what is the water quality? Uh, what is the quality of the water that we drink? What is the, air? What is the quality of the air? Uh, this is a community that suffers a lot with earthquakes. So that was another uh, major thing. But the idea behind this was that, um, so in bringing together this community, we wanted to uh, engage not only children, but also <laughs> parents, uh, other members of the communities, uh, to work closely with scientists, uh, artists uh, as well, or activists, to kind of provide responses uh, to these qu questions that are uh, personally relevant, um, societ societ they had societal relevance as well, but they mostly they were personally meaningful for them. Um, now, why, why is this important? Because uh, it offers them a sense of agency uh, over their learning. Uh, it offers them uh, an opportunity to, to understand the value of science to their everyday lives and to utilize this, uh, utilize this scientific knowledge. Um, some important characteristics of this program is that the curriculum is co-created uh, between educators and these families and the students as well. The questions uh, do come from the students. Um, and 
other innovation is that the program takes place in an abandoned space in this community setting that we curated together. So this removes barriers related to, to access or transportation. Uh, it's also free and it's also multilingual. multilingual. We invite students to bring in their home languages, even though we don't always understand uh, their, 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 that language. Um, but for me, the kind of uh, the premise of this, uh, of this project and why it aligns with participatory education is that uh, it starts from the premise that learning is intergenerational. So it's important to bring uh, families in. And when I, I don't refer to biological families, I refer to uh, to parents of all sorts, I refer to grandparents, I refer to community members. Um, the second one um, is that learning doesn't happen only in schools. In fact, I would argue that uh, schools are a horrible place to ever learn anything uh, because they're so unnatural uh, socially. And then, so we take opportunities uh, to curate spaces outside of school to facilitate learning. Um, and the third premise, and I know that I would be crushed about saying this, is that uh, science is political, education is political, um, and knowledge is political as well. So these are, this is what we're trying to do with this, um, with this project. So, um, so I think you know where I'm going with this, and this is my personal take on uh, participatory education, is that I think it provides a, a particularly striking opportunity uh, for inclusiveness, for rethinking about questions uh, like who participates in knowledge production, uh, who decides about the curriculum, uh, who is considered a legitimate producer of knowledge, or who is uh, considered a consumer of, of knowledge? Who gets to decide what scientific questions uh, to investigate? And, and even lastly, what kind of knowledge and practice counts as scientific uh, or valid knowledge? And my take on that is that we have a lot to learn from, uh, from the local communities. I'll leave it to that. Thank you, Dr. Abrahamidu. Where are you bringing this project to Cyprus? <laughs> I think, so, yeah, I'm going to share more about this later on. But I think, so I have an insider, insider status in Cyprus. I've lived in Cyprus for, for most of my life, and I've only been living abroad for the past six years. And I, I want to share later on projects that are done in Cyprus that are, because this project was inspired by a project that we carried out in Cyprus in 2008. Great. Uh, Dr. Theodoriou, following from uh, Dr. Abraham, you project-based approach and learning, uh, and knowing your background, we realize that education is not happening only in schools and the classrooms. It's a lifelong pro uh, process, regardless of space and time. And from your experience uh, in designing and implementing participatory learning processes on the grassroots level, I mean, what are the challenges you face? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that many of us would like to, to be aware of these challenges in the design of similar educational initiatives. And uh, how did you overcome those, maybe through a couple of examples? Thank you, uh, Dr. Themistocleus. Uh, it's a good transition from what uh, Dr. Abramidou has already mentioned because a lot of the points that I wanted to make, they, they relate to that. So when we talk about participatory education, we have the, the learner, uh, whether that's um, an adult or a student in school, in the center. So uh, necessarily we need to move away from the traditional teacher-centric approaches that have to do with um, maybe lectures or just providing all the information comes from the educator. So by putting the, the learner in the center, then we try to match and see what the needs are of that learner, whether they are in, in formal education setting or a non-formal education setting, and try to address them in a way that actually gives them the opportunity to try to work with the educator in the learning process. So um, in, in my field, in, in the work that, um, that we do um, at the, the CSI, we work mostly with non-formal education. So we work with projects that have to do mainly with adults, youth, adults, and maybe marginalized uh, populations. 
So what we try to do is that we design trainings that are based on their needs. Uh, we try to address some of the challenges that they have uh, in their life, and we try to do that while we have them as part of the training program's curriculum. So we engage them, we co-design, uh, like Dr. Avramidou mentioned. We have small groups that we work together. Um, we do mentorship programs, so we have the learners become mentees and mentor themselves and uh, like um, train each other, provide feedback to each other. And this moves the um, learning to the kind of a metacognition level, which is what we want. So we try to also engage um, other stakeholders that might have to do with a specific topic. So um, NGOs, CSOs, policymakers, parents, if we are talking about youth or um, children in high school, uh, because we feel that they are also part of what needs to be done in order for particip participatory education, or as we might want to call it, active learning, in order for it to be successful. So um, I know that in sciences and in, ma in maths, it might seem that it's easier to do that, to approach it that way. So when we talk about STEAM, we can kind of see where we can go with a project-driven approach. But it's really important to think about humanities and social sciences and see how we can bring that, the participatory education, into those fields as well. So other than that, what I just mentioned, the peer mentoring that we have in our programs, the peer teaching, the small groups, um, we also have community-driven projects. So for example, we had a project that had to do with green cities. So we took teams and we um, actually planted um, flowers and plants at the rooftop. So you kind of take them there and they become part of the actual practical process. Um, and uh, we try to take approaches that are really uh, alternative, that are going to allow the learner to provide their own knowledge and their own approaches so that they teach each other. And now I go to the challenges uh, that you I'm wanted to find out more about. I think the biggest challenge, and it goes to the intergenerational uh, aspect, is that um, the generations are currently changing in the sense that they are being taught. So we were talking about adults and maybe a bit more older adults that they were, they were raised in an educational system that was really teacher-centric and the expectation is that the educator has all the information and they're going to go to a training and everything will be provided to them, then that can become an issue because you need to train those learners and to prep them in order to be able to function in a, in a program that is um, uh, based on active learning and participatory education. So that can become one of the challenges, how to transform education, <coughs> which also goes back to the reform of education so that we um, integrate this sort of um, learning approach so that all the learners from different styles they can benefit so that takes we take that into account in the first sessions of every training program to account for that aspect how do we prep our learners in order to be able to learn best in that condition. And then we also need to consider time, because when we talk about participatory education, uh, because we provide equal opportunities for all their learners to engage uh, in the same way, according to their needs, we need to be flexible a bit with time and not be really rigid in the sense that, you know, I'm going to have a, a three-hour training program and I'm going to split it into 10 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes. We need, we need to go along with the flow. So uh, we need to be able to allow for some time adjustment and flexibility so that every learner uh, can approach it and learn on their, on their own pace. Excellent. I, I can understand that the, one of the biggest challenges is to teach people how to learn, how to participate. And I think there is a kind of a, a circle there on how things are processing. And it's a, it's a good uh, point to go back to Dr. Avram. You do, uh, and this is not a personal uh, question, uh, Lucy, okay? Uh, as an academic bringing specialized experience and knowledge in your sector, how open would you be talking for the academic community? How open would you be uh, to develop your courses with the wider community, your students, maybe the market, the society actors? Uh, how, how is academia overall responding to this movement of democracy, more participation, more, more recognition of non-conventional forms of, of learning? I mean, again, this is not personal, but academics, academics are not holding uh, the, the power of knowledge anymore. It's so much out there. Uh, how, how is this uh, uh, affecting 
the academia and how academia will respond to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Zadiris. Yeah, that's a very timely question. So maybe I will start by sharing what has been changing in academia uh, in the past five years at least, and then I, I will move on to, to share some personal thoughts and examples uh, from my work. Um, so uh, what we're witnessing in academia in the last five years, I think uh, there is a strong focus and push towards addressing the 2030 uh, sustainability goals, which is only eight years from today, and which touches upon all aspects of, of life on Earth. Um, so consequently, there is a lot of attention to transdisciplinary uh, transdisciplinarity, to partnerships with the industry, NGOs, science centers, museums, galleries, uh, community settings, and in general, a lot more attention is being paid on uh, on learning that takes place uh, outside of uh, outside of the university, um, and we see that not only in the kinds of program of studies that are offered uh, right now, which are much more interdisciplinary and intersectional, uh, but also the kind of research that is that is being done, which is again uh, much more interdisciplinary than it uh, than it used to be five years ago, and it also has a more strong focus on on impact in terms of societal uh, impact. Uh, now, this is better done in some countries uh, uh, or not as uh, nicely done in, in other countries and, and for good reasons, of course. Um, now, an example fro from my work, maybe I'll share something recent. Uh, I teach in a master's program on science communication and I teach a course called Science and the Public. Uh, my students are all master's students, they come from different disciplines, uh, mostly from the sciences, sciences, but I do have a few artists uh, in the class as well. Uh, so during the pandemic, uh, what we did, given, given the urgency and need to engage with the, with the public in issues around uh, public health, uh, vaccination and so on, um, we engage in designing a traveling exhibit around COVID, um, which travel mostly in the northern part of the country, which is uh, populated by underserved uh, or high poverty um, areas and communities that are usually disengaged uh, with science or uh, that uh, communities that have been um, marginalized uh, from science. So that was one. Um, and the other thing that we did, and this was as part of the course, uh, was for students to interview scientists uh, from different fields and produce short videos uh, that were again made publicly available uh, for the purpose of engaging the public with, uh, with crucial questions around the pandemic. But to do that, they work with, uh, with many different people, uh, professionals uh, from the field of public engagement with science, they work with curators, uh, they work with community members, they work with artists, uh, and they work with, uh, with scientists. Um, so so that's, a, that's an example uh, of kind, I think, provides a first step uh, or approach to participatory uh, education. Um, but by sharing this, I, I would like to, to also share that we shouldn't maybe necessarily be looking for examples in, uh, in other countries because uh, there are already a lot of amazing initiatives uh, and projects or examples of participatory, participatory approaches to education that are taking place uh, in Cyprus and these are organized by individuals, NGOs or uh, local communities in Cyprus. Um, but I think also kind of looking from a distance in the, uh, on this one, I think that this serves more, more as a kind of pockets of resistance to a, to a broken educational and, and social system uh, than anything else, which of course is, is very, very valuable, but I think a bottom-up approach alone um, is not going to do it. Uh, so I think for uh, thinking about the, the future again, I think for such a change to, to happen at a more uh, substantial scale, a systemic approach is needed uh, that, it, that includes uh, top-down investment uh, at the governmental level, at the Ministry of Education level, 
that aims to redesign the very ethnocentric national curriculum, uh, as well as the, the evaluation and accreditation uh, system that we currently have to formally recognize uh, su such practices. And I'll, I'll give up two examples here. Imagine of the possibility of someone earning tiny CTS or, or credits uh, if they attend five science cafes uh, throughout the year. Uh, or if they spend 100 hours of engaging in a citizen science project or in a local community community project that, or attending a robotics uh, summer school or a STEAM uh, academy that I know are happening in Cyprus and they could carry these, uh, these ECTS uh, to university. Uh, I think that will really be uh, groundbreaking and really transform uh, the, the education. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abramio. I mean, two very important points. The first one is the, uh, the moment of resistance uh, that we experienced throughout the years, also working together in many, in many projects. Are, uh, it, it, they are a hope. And uh, I agree with you that uh, we need to uh, maximize them <coughs> and maybe find a way to make them in a more organized way. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way that will put some real pressure in the decision-making uh, level. And uh, the only thing to do that, in my personal opinion, is to po populate this resistance yep. um, in, in this uh, process. And the last point about uh, accreditation. Um, in the last uh, year, there is uh, at last uh, an open discussion in Cyprus how uh, non-formal learning, uh, informal learning can be transferred as credits to universities or uh, for uh, people that they want to go back to education, how can they use this? So it's very important and uh, thank you for bringing this up. Now, going to another um, group of power, the European Union, uh, oh. uh, Dr. Gizil Jurek, uh, I guess you heard a lot of times that the, one of the biggest challenges of the European Union is a distance from its citizens. Many of the decisions that are being taken at that level do not re really relate with any of us. Uh, and especially in, in areas uh, like education uh, and society in, in general. Uh, being a member of the parliament and a representative of the citizens and uh, your voters coming from an academic background, how, how would you suggest this to change, to maximize uh, the, the civil participation in decision making at the European level. How do you suggest for citizens to have a more, uh, a, a more saying in this process and also to make them more related to the decisions you and your colleagues are taking every day in the, in the parliament? Well, that's a very uh, hot issue. I mean, I just uh, want to remind you that the European Parliament is the only institution elected by the citizens. So if we go to council or commission, we're gonna find the nation states, member states deciding mainly for themselves. And if it can happen for common good, also it's not bad. Uh, but when we go to the parliament, first of all, let me tell that the member states, they deprive even the parliament of uh, full participation in decision making. So it's still, for example, one of our demands is to increase the role of the parliament, European parliament in decision making, because exactly we are elected by the citizens of the European Union. Now, so by this actually, I, I, I already, I assume I already mentioned that tension we have between parliament, commission and council. Many times, what we decide in the parliament is ignored by the commission, for example. So you see, even at that level, you see the gap between citizens and doer and the commission and council. So there is again a tension between state and societies in the European Union. And of course, a lot of discussion is going on. We had this conference for the future of the European Union. We want to have a more participatory of course, European Union, and exactly one of the solutions is to enhance the role of European Parliament. 
because that is there where citizens are actually playing a direct role, because we do vote for representatives. And this is one. The second thing, to my mind, we have to overcome this concept of uh, are we national, so one state, and, citi and citizens of European Union, how do we combine these two dimensions? Because European citizens, of course, we have uh, two dimensions. We are citizens of our nation states, but also we are citizens of European Union. At some point, there is a, it's not always a harmonious relationship, this one. So how can we, for example, develop a more uh, European consciousness that we are struggling for a common good for all of us? This, uh, how can we really, I wouldn't say undermine the existence of nations, you can't undermine them anyhow, but I mean so that their role is uh, not as strong as it is today. They are game, exactly, you want a participatory uh, understanding. That is enhancing the parliament. It's not good enough. We have to get more and more of the civil society involved in our, uh, uh, I mean, we don't do enough of that. I mean, we, for example, we celebrated last year the Year of Youth. I'm in a cult committee, so it was directly related to my, to my job too there. And we wanted youth to come together and discuss for their own problems and propose solutions for their own problems, not we to talk about the youth. So that kind of participatory processes are important, not good enough, not, not maybe not enough, but we should do more of this. Get more and more uh, NGOs to involve civil society, to involve in the processes. And actually, European Union, right now, to my, to my mind, we are in a kind of crisis. We are to heading from here onwards. That would be one of the solutions, more participation. And you know, like in politics, but also in education, participatory understanding, it means, it touches very sensitive issues. On the one hand, it brings in the democratization, and of course, any democratization touches the issues of power. So you come in a tension with power structures. This is exactly what's happened also in academia. If you tell to a professor, you don't, you don't need to teach uh, teacher-centric, I mean, you are behind a desk and you say, uh, just you tell, when it's a kind of loss of power. No one likes it. So we, uh, <laughs> it's not easy uh, to put yourself also uh, to get out of this role. So to back to European Parliament, yes, we want more participation also in society at all levels, but to achieve this, to be really honest and uh, realistic, without enhancing the role of the Parliament, which is an institution elected by the citizens, uh, we will not go, we will not be really uh, tackling substantially the issue of democratic, lack of democratic legitimization. That's extremely important, especially thank you for bringing up the, the role of civil society and uh, being part of this uh, domain, the civil society, uh, we can assure everybody at the European uh, Union level that the, the civil society is working very well together at the European level. European Union is helping in that through funds and initiatives actually. And uh, European Union has to take in advantage what they actually try to promote, to bring the civil society together at the European level. They do it in a very good way, but they don't take in advantage this union. To consider also the results and achievements which come from the civil society initiatives. Exactly, exactly. And uh, <coughs> talking about uh, <coughs> more participation and more involvement of, of, the, uh, of the citizens, uh, I go back to Dr. Theodoridou and uh, the, um, the process of digital transformation that is uh, obviously affecting everybody horizontally in the society. We know that at the CSI, uh, we use a lot of technology uh, to promote uh, social inclusion and participation in many uh, of our work. But uh, I would like to ask you, do you also use technology in co-design educational initi initiatives for marginalized groups like migrants, uh, women, uh, youth? Uh, what type of technologies is used to empower this? I mean, this would be a good example maybe for other uh, friends that are here in the audience and they are in the same area to take some of these examples with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Themistocleus. 
Um, definitely, um, and especially through COVID, uh, we've seen that uh, we cannot uh, exclude technology from education in any way possible. I mean, in the past, we used to say that we need to use technology where there is added value, and that's, that's true. I, I still believe that. However, when you're faced with a pandemic and you need to come up with um, some, um, how to integrate technology in a really f fast way, an active way, so that we don't lose two or three years of learning, um, then you need to come up with uh, more collaborative approaches in terms of the technology that is used. So yes, one of the priorities at uh, the Center for Social Innovation is to uh, design programs that uh, will help populations that are not um, uh, let's just say marginalized populations that are not given as equal opportunities as other um, uh, parts of the population in terms of the education opportunities that they are provided. So we design mostly e-learning programs uh, where we use um, LMS platforms. We try to make everything be accessible on mobile devices because we all know that mobile devices are part of our life nowadays, so that we use them in everyday um, functions. So why not try to integrate that as part of the learning as well? So we design um, e-learning programs that have, they use tools that are more collaborative, like wikis and Google Docs and uh, blogs and, uh, you know, tools where you know that the learner will need to collaborate with another learner in order to have an outcome uh, that they can present. And through the process, they learn, they mentor each other. Um, now, in terms of um, our preferences, I would say that we do believe that blended learning is kind of more beneficial for these specific uh, parts of the population because they also value so much and they benefit from the face-to-face -face teaching as well. So we try to design blended learning programs where we have a first session uh, with uh, migrants, let's say, or youth, and then we also have a debriefing session at the end. And in the meantime, we have these collaborative e-learning programs where they, uh, they take charge of their learning, they, it's self-paced, all the material is there, but we have, um, we try to use videos and other material that is going to well, it's going to be attractive and also beneficial to all the learning styles that we're trying to, um, to reach out to. So um, we need to be also conscious of their needs as well and the time that they have available in order to devote to this. So we try to go by um, their uh, needs and how they can benefit from this, um, from this experience. Thank you, Dr. Theodorido. It's, it's extremely important the examples we gave for technology, uh, because we, we truly believe that technology can take the, the local element to the global element. And that's where I want to ask Dr. Uh, Melina. I mean, uh, you are representing beyond the beautiful soul of a republic, also uh, UNICEF. And uh, I mean, how, how a political uh, and social shift is achieved at the global level? I mean, it sounds so big, I know. But uh, coming from an organization like uh, UNICEF, how, how, do you, how do you see this in the future, to change uh, the future and the way we understand uh, and, uh, education? Um, and uh, what are the challenges uh, that you see in, uh, in, this, in this process that to change the way we see that education development, curriculum development, learning process that will affect uh, our global village? Thank you very much. First of all, uh, really, your focus on, um, uh, on participation, participatory uh, education is, uh, is absolutely critical. This is uh, the way uh, we have uh, been looking at it also uh, from the global perspective, whether it's UNICEF or also, um, of course, uh, UNESCO is uh, involved a lot. Uh, but um, as I have mentioned, um, in, the, in the 2030 agenda context, um, in the SDG context, uh, this, is, uh, this is the same. Uh, and um, I would say that uh, education is probably the most cross-cutting uh, uh, of all the SDGs. Uh, because um, when we uh, succeed on, on education, this is an enabler of all the other processes, uh, whether we are talking about uh, gender uh, equality or we are talking about uh, uh, various other opportunities and other sectors uh, that uh, that are there. Uh, you going back to participation. You may remember that uh, uh, probably about ten years ago, uh, 
former Secretary General of the UN Ban Ki-moon invited Malala to first time participate in the UN General Assembly. And uh, she was uh, sitting uh, on the balcony of, uh, of the building and observing uh, the leaders' dialogue. Well, uh, the good news is that we have, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, really progressed a lot uh, since then. It's not enough to have young people observe uh, leaders' dialogue. Uh, uh, we have seen that uh, today uh, young people are directly involved um, uh, in, in the dialogues uh, and uh, we have invested a lot in uh, uh, having uh, you know, young people part of the conversations. Uh, uh, colleagues have mentioned already how important uh, it is uh, uh, to have young people directly involved and uh, that it is in fact a learning process for us as well if we engage in, in that dialogue. And this is the, this is the only way uh, forward uh, that young people need to be uh, part of the decision making and uh, and part of the of the solution we have just created a new un youth office uh, in the un uh, this is uh, part of uh, uh, secretary general's uh, 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 our common agenda initiative uh, and one of the elements has been uh, the proposal to create a new UN Youth Office which would be able to oversee and coordinate properly uh, the various aspects of, uh, of youth engagement. Uh, and it's already a reality, uh, you know, youth activism and uh, uh, youth leadership uh, is there. I don't have to uh, say too much about uh, climate, how much um, uh, uh, you, uh, youth uh, uh, climate activists uh, have uh, have shown us the way forward. Uh, uh, you remember the recent uh, Glasgow uh, COP26 conference, uh, and it was obvious that the leaders uh, simply cannot ignore that voice, and uh, they they have to not only listen to the youth voices, but they have to actually take advantage of them and and react properly. And we see the same type of um, engagement on on so many other issues. Uh, so this is uh, this is one element that I wanted to mention. Also, part of the of uh, uh, this initiative, our common agenda is uh, uh, focusing more on uh, uh, creating uh, uh, norms uh, for uh, countering um, uh, the, uh, the spread of uh, fake news uh, and uh, negative uh, propaganda that, uh, that is uh, really uh, uh, a huge uh, challenge for us. Uh, uh, it is uh, uh, for the UN to be the global norm setter, to be uh, an organization that, uh, that creates um, uh, criteria that, uh, that should be helpful for us uh, in, in that particular context. And of course, uh, we have to uh, be able to balance properly. The pandemic has shown us uh, that uh, use of uh, uh, digital technology, including use of social media, is absolutely essential because uh, it is an enabler, it is uh, supporting the various opportunities and digital learning, digital solutions are there. And of course they will be there more and more. But at the same time we have to be uh, balancing properly and we need to equip our young people uh, and also our children with, uh, with the skills that uh, uh, will show them how to distinguish or how to prioritize um, uh, so that they are not uh, susceptible to, uh, to various negative trends. And of course, we are all aware of, uh, of those. Uh, uh, so it is this people uh, uh, focus that we need to also involve in, uh, in uh, uh, supporting the participatory processes. And last but not least, there is another P word, which is partnerships. And uh, you have also already mentioned uh, uh, that as well. Now, nobody can do it alone. Uh, no uh, national government uh, can do it alone. Uh, no minister of education can do it alone. Uh, we need to really make sure that uh, we involve also the private sector. Uh, because uh, often they can provide the additional solutions, the additional resources uh, and the additional opportunities to, to equip the young people uh, with the necessary skills. And we see a huge and actually growing gap 
of, um, uh, of uh, 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 technical skills uh, and uh, uh, vocational training uh, uh, skills that, uh, uh, that uh, we don't have uh, uh, among, um, among our young people. So that's, uh, that's yet another, uh, another important context. But also I would add the local and regional authorities uh, uh, in each, uh, each of our countries uh, uh, because uh, it is in the first place uh, the mayors or the governors of regions uh, that, uh, that can provide for, for the local solutions better often better than the, uh, than the, uh, uh, than the uh, national governments. Uh, and that's yet another focus that we have taken also at the UN, uh, that we need to have um, uh, the mayors, the governors, the local and regional authorities more part of some of the global discussions. Uh, and again, this is one of the lessons uh, that we should learn from the pandemic, because if you look at what was happening du during the pandemic, uh, uh, it is not often the national governments that um, our citizens expected immediate solutions from. Uh, it is more on the local level when um, uh, solutions needed to be provided, whether it was health solutions, uh, social solutions, uh, uh, or of course uh, uh, connectivity or education uh, solutions as well. Uh, but of course um, uh, we cannot uh, uh, just kind of uh, uh, decentralize it uh, to, uh, to the local and regional level without providing uh, uh, the mayors, the governors and, uh, and others uh, with, uh, with the proper tools, um, uh, with uh, the norms and of course also with, uh, with the financing which is, uh, which is critical. And um, also uh, let me add that uh, uh, there is uh, the, the grassroots level there is the civil society uh, and, uh, and other local leaders uh, that absolutely need to be involved. Uh, uh, in which context? Of course, uh, often uh, being the, uh, the conscience of, uh, uh, of the global public good or of the, uh, of the local public good if you, if you uh, go to the local level. So these are the various aspects that, uh, uh, that uh, we are looking at and that I thought uh, uh, could be useful uh, to, uh, to add to, uh, to this discussion. Excellent, Dr. Romina. I mean, uh, definitely the, uh, the partnerships also is one of the goals or the sustainable development goals that are uh, forwarded by the United Nations, something that I think all of us here appreciate and try work towards that direction. I have the, the time ahead of me. Uh, we all have from one minute, but we will I will include in your uh, last uh, um, talk uh, some of the points raised by the audience and you can refer to them uh, as you like. Uh, the first one, or it refers to Dr. Gizil Jurek, but of course it can be for everybody. Um, how we can overcome a hate speech in, in Cyprus and what could be the role of uh, in or outside education, the role of religion in all communities. The other has to uh, do with technology and overcoming the division on the ground and taking a free space in the virtual world. And another question which Katerina um, referred to is how we engage marginalized groups like uh, refugees and migrants in this participatory education process. We all have one minute just to say what we believe about what we discussed today and what we can do in the future. Please see the time there. Well, about uh, hate speech, I mean, uh, first of all, let people to come together. Let the youth to know each other. Instead of talking against or about someone, meet someone. It's not a uh, coincidence that the Secretary General of United Nations is insisting in each report time about the youth, how the youth should come together in Cyprus, and we don't do this. Exchange in the schools, exchange of memories, it's a sphere of education, definitely we, 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 we can do a lot about this, but you have to see the other, talk to the other, you know, instead of imagining the other. Um, big issue, of course, hate speech, and then when it comes to the religion, the role of religion, I mean, religion, like everything else, can do this or that. I mean, it's how you approach religion. I mean, 
in the substance of all the religions, we know that there is love, love to the next one, etc., etc. Uh, of course, we can also be, religion can also contribute to reconciliation, but of course, religion also is also warfare, as we see around the world. So it depends what kind of interpretation you give to the uh, religion, etc. So I am rather a secular person. I would like to see that uh, issues solved. At, at a school level. And one remark, and I finish by this, we are talking about education, but it's very important to mention the question, who will educate the educators? Because either participatory education or anything else, or digital, etc., you need further education of education. And this is an important aspect. Thank you. Very important point. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Silverido. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we, we all know that research has shown that if you have a classroom where you just provide the information to them, most of it is going to go um, just like that. So when you have the learner involved, it means more retention, it means more interest, more motivation. So of course we want to use techniques that have to do with self-reflection, with uh, mentorship, with something that really triggers um, an internal and intrinsic interest in what is being taught in the classroom. And going back to the no uh, person left behind, I do feel that it's really important to focus on marginalized populations that do not have as equal opportunities in order to be part of the mainstream education that is offered. So uh, that's where I think um, CSOs come in, the civic society comes in, in order to try to reach out and provide to this, um, these people something that they can, um, it's useful to them, it's beneficial, it addresses their needs on the ground. And uh, one of the best ways to approach uh, them is through what I mentioned before, blended learning, so that you go along with the time that they have available to do that and it fits their really hectic um, schedule. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Federico. Dr. Ramiro. Yep. Uh, thanks. So I don't, I don't have answers to these questions. Instead, I will raise a set of new questions that I think will help us uh, move forward. Uh, so I will start by this. Let, let's take a look around uh, this room uh, and reflect on uh, what bodies or what identities and what voices are, are represented here today. And then think of, uh, of those bodies or those identities and voices that are missing. What social groups are not here with us uh, today and why? Who is on this panel uh, right now? What voices are not here uh, and why? And I think that's the first step to, to imagining a more participatory and, and socially just future. Um, and for education, especially, I think in order to contribute towards imagining this uh, future, uh, I think the first step is to redefine what educational success means, uh, with a focus on pedagogies of care and resistance instead of pedagogies for the economy. And to do that, this is my last piece, educational institutions, I think, need to stop obsessing with neoliberal paradigms and rankings and instead invest in uh, bringing about social change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abramidou. Excellent. Dr. Inar. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, um, we really need to be truly inclusive. Uh, uh, we often pay lip service to to uh, exclude, uh, to uh, being uh, inclusive to inclusiveness, uh, and we o often don't uh, fully understand what it means. And it, of course, includes uh, migrants. Um, it includes, uh, you know, in the, in the Cyprus case, uh, um, youth from uh, both communities, uh, uh, creating opportunities for engagement. Because um, education is is a very powerful tool, also for peace building. Uh, for reconciliation, for uh, building uh, the future. So uh, that's uh, something that, that needs to be uh, kept in mind. Uh, second, um, we need to empower the teachers. Um, uh, the teachers should not be left behind either. We can hardly uh, expect um, uh, to have uh, new results and uh, new opportunities without uh, uh, empowering our teachers and, and giving them the additional opportunities which they may have never had because these things don't happen on their own or automatically. So, of course, I fully agree uh, with uh, that particular element. Uh, um, thirdly, harnessing the, the digital uh, revolution, the, the digital uh, skills. Uh, uh, and finally, 
in investing more. And when I say investing, uh, it doesn't only mean uh, in financial terms, uh, but there are different ways uh, how um, our education systems need, need to be invested in uh, more equitably and more efficiently. Uh, and uh, maybe I can, I can say an example from uh, Slovakia from some years ago. Uh, we once had a very successful finance minister who was labeled as a reformist and uh, actually today he serves as a, a special uh, advisor uh, to the Prime Minister of Ukraine on, on important reforms, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, of course also a very important context. Uh, and at one point uh, uh, he was offered the position of Minister of Education. Uh, and it was not a coincidence. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, we need to uh, look for creative solutions also in, in such contexts. Uh, uh, and uh, we need to uh, be bold uh, uh, even in uh, uh, situations like that. Uh, so I, I will leave, uh, leave you with uh, just uh, you know, some additional uh, food for thought in, in that context. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and uh, for the very positive messages for uh, uh, the future, although in, in a dissolving world, uh, Dr. Gisigler, and uh, I, I hope that we will manage to transfer the ownership of, an, of, of education uh, to the people, to the communities, and to those that they are really interested in this. Thank you for the great discussion, and thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.